at the United Nations General Assembly's first ever high-level meeting on tuberculosis to accelerate efforts in ending TB and reach all affected people with prevention and care. Sounds very ambitious. The theme of the meeting is United to End Tuberculosis, an urgent global response to a global epidemic. The high-level meeting should result in an ambitious political declaration on TB endorsed by heads of state that will strengthen action and investments for the end TB response, saving millions of lives. Our guests today, uh, Paula Fujiwara is the scientific director of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease. Dr. Fujiwara was formerly the director of the Bureau of TB Control at the New York City Department of Health during the 1990s, when multi-drug resistant TB broke out in the Big Apple and was charged with eliminating it at a time when HIV was also fueling the epidemic. Dr. Fujiwara is on the executive committee of the Stop TB Partnership and was in charge of the committee developing the key TB asks to guide the TB community for the issues they wanted considered for the political declaration. And in the front row over here, Michael Kessler is a media consultant working in global health. Aside from the International Union, Michael... Uh, uh, the, uh, sorry. <laughs> Aside from the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, Michael has been a long-term media consultant for the International AIDS Society on its scientific and international AIDS conferences and also works for a number of other clients, including the Non-Communicable Diseases Alliance, the special advisor to the joint United Nations program on AIDS in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, among others. So he's around to chat if you want to talk later. Dr. Fujiwara will make an opening statement about 10 minutes, and then we'll open for questions. Over okay. Well, well, thank you so much. Um, uh, and thank you for joining us for this very critical uh, meeting in advance of the first level, uh, first United Nations high-level meeting on TB, which will be on the 26th of September. I'm Paula Fujiwara. As stated, I'm the scientific director of the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, known as the Union. Uh, I'd like to extend my thanks to Sherwin, just now, who actually gave all my talk, and the UN Correspondents Association for organizing this briefing at such short notice. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to congratulate on record the extraordinary leadership that your Minister of Health, Minister Aaron Mozzoletti, has uh, shown in pushing this high-level meeting to be held. He put this together and decided that we should have this in December of 2016, and we have the result now. So he's been an inspiring chair of the Stop TB Partnership, and as we all know by now, the South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has publicly announced his, his intention to attend this high-level meeting, which is highly significant, but I'll say more about that later. Uh, let, me, uh, let me briefly outline what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to start off quickly saying a few words about my organization, the International Union, and where it sits in the TB world, and then I'm going to move on to talk about the conci very concise overview of the TB epidemic, followed by a review of what the TB community, the TB sector, has actually officially asked to be prioritized in this declaration. Review where the declaration stands, uh, as it stands right now, because it isn't, uh, hasn't been finalized, and uh, what it does and doesn't address, and then finally reflect on where we're going to go post-HLM. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the uh, work of the union, we've been founded 100 years ago. We're based in Paris. And although our original mission was basically on tuberculosis, we have um, now have staff in 10 offices and work around the world in 150 countries and deal with lung health and HIV. So we're a global scientific organization, and the mission is to improve health, lung health in low and middle income countries. So we conduct clinical trials to make uh, better regimens for tuberculosis and TB HIV. We do operational research in order to improve the, uh, the outcomes within countries and in regions. We deliver life-saving services to people in need. For example, in Myanmar, we have 31,000 people that we monitor uh, for antiretrovirals. We do technical expertise, uh, trainings, management skills. And then we have an international meeting every year, uh, the World Conference on Lung Health, which, as I like to say, that if a bomb dropped on the conference center when we have this conference, the entire TB community would be gone. So we're going to tuberculosis. It kills more people in the world than any other infectious disease, and it now surpasses HIV. Everyone knows about HIV. Not so, not so many people know about this issue about tuberculosis. And the best available data that we have from 2016, which is from the World Health Organization, shows that worldwide we have an estimated 10.4 million people with tuberculosis, of which 1.7 million actually die. And of that 10.4 million, we have six, so the, the, that was the estimate. And of this 10.4 million, 6.4 million 
a million cases were actually reported by countries to the World Health Organization. So that means an astounding 40% are missing. And that is part of the problem. Child tuberculosis, which I'm glad to say has been included in this declaration, has now become a human rights issue because one million children under the age of 15 every year develop tuberculosis, become sick, and of that, 239,000 actually die of this disease, curable disease. The other issue that's important is tuberculosis is becoming more resistant to antibiotics, and of all the deaths we're now seeing from drug-resistant bacteria, viruses, fungi, tuberculosis makes up for a third of all of these deaths. So here's a scandal that we have an infectious, the world's deadliest infectious disease, and we're, which is actually preventable, treatable, and curable, we have this problem. So we're talking about an, uh, an epidemic that is really wreaking havoc in the communities and economies. So KPMG, the accounting firm, has done an economic analysis on this, and it shows that by their accounting, tuberculosis will cost the global no economy $1 trillion over the next 15 years. So ending the uh, tuberculosis epidemic by 2030 is part of the Sustainable Development Goals. It's Sustainable Development Goal number three, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all ages. We are clearly not on target to achieve this. And turning this epidemic around requires a new era of investment and political engagement. And no matter how hard we try, those of us in the health sector, those of us who are technical people, simply cannot end this epidemic alone. We need high level political leadership. Why is that? Because it requires action from the social and economic sectors and high level political leaders are the only ones that can do that. And so this up upcoming HLM on tuberculosis is really the best opportunity that we have ever to get the world leaders to get involved and make the necessary actions to end the epidemic for good. I want to make clear a very important point. Today, the tuberculosis epidemic, as you probably know, is concentrated in low and middle income countries. India alone accounts for approximately a, a quarter of all of the world's cases and a quarter of all the global deaths. Yet, I think it would be a mistake to see tuberculosis as a problem just of the poor living in the poorer countries, although India now being a middle-income country. So history has shown that tuberculosis can actually rear its ugly head uh, time and time again. And as it was pointed out already, it was about 20 years ago that I was the director of the Bureau of Tuberculosis Control here in New York City during the 1990s when we had HIV-related tuberculosis outbreaks, hospital outbreaks. I don't know if any of you are old enough or were living here at the time, but we had outbreaks in 11 of the city's hospitals, and we were charged with eliminating, eliminating it. And it's really sobering to think that it's a time of unprecedented people movement and urbanization that around a quarter of the world's population, maybe some of this actually in this room, actually have latent tuberculosis infection that's just living in your body's dormant. So eliminating tuberculosis is of interest to all political leaders, not just those from high burden countries. So what, here's what we are asking as a TB community, to act on five key priorities, and I'll go in each of these in turn. So these are the ones that we think are the most important. This is done by consensus. It took us three months to arrive at uh, five, five key uh, priorities. The first is that we must reach everyone, anyone who needs tuberculosis care. This means closing the gaping holes in tuberculosis diagnosis, treatment, and increasingly the issue of prevention by diagnosing and treating a cumulative 40 million people by 2022. This is not a number that came out of the hat. We're actually asking, asking for more. This was, this was a negotiation to come to 40 million, and it has, if you look at the, we have data to show by each country how many of them would be affected. So to reach this 40 million, we also need to reach 3.5 million children and also 1.5 million people with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. The second thing we need to do is to really transform this response by, replacing, by placing human rights at the core. Every person with tuberculosis needs to, be, to know their HIV status. We know with people with HIV, know your status. That's been an important part of the response. Whether a person has active disease or whether you have the infection dormant in your, in your body. And they also have the right to accessible, affordable access to services and care. The other issue that's a big problem with tuberculosis is stigma. We talk about HIV stigma, but I think that people now living with HIV are very, they are very willing to state their status, but people with tuberculosis do not. And we need to have this, this issue addressed. However, not everyone is at risk 
for tuberculosis. They're what we call key populations. They're people by virtue of the diseases that they have, for example, diabetes, people with HIV, people who smoke actually uh, are at risk, minors because of the conditions that they are, people who are in prisons, health workers, the people who are taking care of the people with tuberculosis, children I've already mentioned, people, and people, you may not know this, but people in contact with livestock because there's a transmission that can happen of tuberculosis from animals to humans, and mostly through unpasteurized dairy products. The third thing we need to have is the new tools. And this is probably the Im most important issue that we need to address. We're seeing new breakthroughs every day in the medical field. However, not so much in tuberculosis. In terms of innovation, we're limping along. In the past 50 years, we've only had two new TB medications delaminid and bedaquilin, when we need a pipeline of 18, according to WHO estimates. This slow progress puts tuberculosis in, in TB innovation, puts us all of us in danger, as we're seeing drug resistance get worse and worse. We have the same challenges with diagnostics. For example, we, I mentioned the children, the million children a year. The problem is that we do not have the good diagnostic test to diagnose this uh, disease in children. Same with vaccines. An effective vaccine would help us end tuberculosis, and the one we have is almost 100 years old, and it's 50% effective. So we want to see the heads of state really create a research-enabling environment to do this. And I'm very proud to say that the BRICS countries have put together a TB research consortium uh, that, will, that will help address this issue. The other issue is important, and it'll, it'll, I'll come back to this in a second, because there's one po point of disagreement in the political declaration. This includes what we need to do is to incentivize open data sharing, supporting innovative strategies for intellectual property, and investing in research so we can have treat final products as public goods, uh, thereby ensuring their affordab affordability, their accessibility, their, and their quality. The fourth thing, to do all this work, we're gonna need the funds to actually uh, end tuberculosis. We have not seen, we have never seen the resources uh, needed for tuberculosis research and care and, and uh, like that's gone to other epidemics like HIV or Ebola. In total, we want to see, as a TB community, $13 billion a year to fund the global TB response. We have about half of that amount now. As part of that, I mentioned the tools that we need, the new diagnostics, the new vaccines, the new drugs. We need to see $1.3 billion invested worldwide every year in research, and currently we only have 700,000, we're 600, 000, 600, excuse me, 600 million um, uh, more than we have right now. So seven, we have about 700 million. Finally, all of, the sub, all of the, what I've described is subject to decisive, accountable, global leadership, and that's where the political, uh, the heads of state come in. We want to see an independent body established that monitors progress through the commitments that the heads of state approve in September and makes that information available so that, so that um, communities can actually work to push on their governments for continuous progress. So we can't underestimate the, the importance of this meeting. If we think back to the first uh, UN high-level meeting on HIV in 2001, what came out of that was the Global Fund to, uh, to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. So it was really game changer, and this is the stakes are very high. Now, I should note here that, uh, as mentioned, the day after the inaugural meeting uh, on this meeting on um, TB, we're going to have a high-level meeting, a follow-up high-level meeting on non-communicable diseases. And our position in the TB community is that we want as many heads of state to come to both of these meetings because these diseases do not exist in a vacuum. TB is one disease, non-communicable diseases are, are many. And we're seeing more and more links between TB and HIV, uh, excuse me, uh, TB and non-communicable diseases. For example, diabetes has emerged as an important risk factor for tuberculosis because the immune system of people with diabetes is, is weakened and that makes people more susceptible to tuberculosis, just like it has done with HIV. So we're seeing high rates, think about this, in India, which has the highest numbers of TB cases, China, which is the third highest, they're, having, they're becoming middle income countries, they have m much more uh, obesity, obesity is related to diabetes, so now we're again adding fuel to the fire of tuberculosis. So we really need a coordinated response from the heads of state for this high-level meeting. So how are we doing? Let me talk about this political declaration. We're six weeks out uh, from, from this HLM. We've seen commitments so far. Uh, as I said, South Africa, the president, has committed to come. Rwanda, 
Ghana, Uruguay, and most very importantly, the philanthropist Bill Gates has said that he will be attending. And the impetus, the importance of that is that the impetus of having someone as high profile as Bill Gates come is going to hopefully, and it's, it's been said already that some heads of state saying, if someone like that comes, then we will be willing to also um, make that effort. How about the high income countries? UK, US, France, Germany, Canada, we don't know yet. Uh, we'd like to see some pu public commitments uh, over the coming weeks and the, in addition, this HLM should result in an ambitious political declaration on tuberculosis endorsed by these heads of state that is strong enough to, the, uh, to, st to turn the tide uh, if they follow through on their commitments. There's been a mixed response to the draft declaration. This was supposed to be finalized in July. It's still not finalized because the draft, after very intense pressure from the United States, removed the critical language being fought by developing countries that would protect their rights to access affordable medications through the TRIPS agreement, and that is the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. And that gives some flexibilities, and there's some, an add-on to the TRIPS agreement called the Doha Declaration of two, uh, 2011 that cannot prevent countries while respecting intellectual property rights to deal with public health crises, and by any measure, TB is one. So South Africa, actually, uh, you probably know the process of the HLMs. You, the co-coordinators finalize the document. It enters a period of silence, and the, the policy is that no one tries to break the silence. However, South Africa is brave enough to break this silence, saying that we do not agree with the lack of this language about the TRIPS agreement and also uh, the, access the accessibility. So this lack of language can only be interpreted as a move to protect the interests of drug companies at the expense of universal access and saving. Funding, we are asking, the TB community has asked for 13 billion per year starting now. In the declaration it says at least 13 billion per year by 2022. So they're giving a little bit of lay leeway but also saying that maybe we'll give a little bit more. We have not seen governments, another thing that's still still in play is that we've not seen governments support the basic concept of all people affected with tuberculosis and really knowing their status. As I said, knowing one's HIV status has been very important to the response, so we really need to have people know their TB status. If you don't know, everyone thinks, in the work I do in tuberculosis, everyone says, you work in TB? I thought this disappeared years ago. But obviously it is not, and we still need to raise it, raise it as a simple public health awareness of tuberculosis. But on a positive side, the declaration negotiations have uh, we've seen support the needs for new targets for TB treatment, including treatment of children, people with drug-resistant tuberculosis, and for prevention. And children are a priority because we've been, uh, they have been widely neglected in the response to tuberculosis and we're seen as a win that the most recent draft commits to including tuberculosis among the risks to child survival that governments address as a priority. So we think the declaration, if the most recent draft is a guide, will help us make serious progress against child TB. So to end, the unless world leaders agree on urgent actions to accelerate the current progress against tuberculosis, the SDG target number three <coughs> could be missed by decades, maybe even 100 years, at a cost of over a trillion dollars uh, in lost economic output in countless lives. So it's not just a health issue, it's an economic issue, a development issue, a security issue, and we need leadership from heads of state. And if they don't deliver into September, we are going to do everything in our power to hold them accountable for lives lost. But we're hoping that the, we'll look back to September 26 and see it as a turning point in the uh, fight to end this disease. I'm going to leave you with 16 words. And this is, this is the key, if you know, of the, of the five key elements. Treat all people with TB well. Use new tools. Make, invest the resources and keep your promises. If you, if you think about that, those are the five elements that I've, that I've described, and that will really uh, help us move the, uh, the issue along. So thank you very much. I will just say with uh, a long list of uh, d demands like that, I mean, coming to the United Nations is often not the best place, right? Uh, but, but good luck. Good luck, uh, Dr. Fujiwara. I think you've laid out a case. It's just that political leadership is often missing uh, from these uh, discussions. So let's open up for questions. Um, we'll start with Edie, and then we'll go to Carla. Uh, thank you very much, Edith Lutterer from the Associated Press. Um, a few, a few follow-ups. Um, you said, started out saying that um, 
TB is now more deadly than AIDS. Can you give us the figures to back that up? And uh, of numbers. Um, on, and can you also t tell us the top 10 countries? You said India was number one, China's, China's number three. And obstacles, um, aside from this issue of trips, um, are there any other um, big outstanding issues? And where are all the negotiations taking place on the, the final document? Okay, so in terms of the, uh, the most deadly infectious disease, the most common infectious disease now, I mentioned that we have the estimation of the 10.4 million cases, and we have the, about the six, six million uh, per year. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the numbers are contrasting the, the ones for TB and HIV, TB, I don't have the, ex excuse me, I don't have the exact numbers right now, but it's, it is, I can, I can give those, I can give those numbers to you. Now, in terms of the top 10 countries, I can tell you the top five. Uh, <laughs> so you noted, you noted India, and you noted the third one, China, but the second one is now Indonesia. And the fourth one is the Philippines, and the fifth one is Pakistan. So you can see that Asia is a really big player, uh, player in this. People think about uh, TB and HIV, especially in Africa, but really the big issue is in the, uh, in, uh, the Asian countries. The final, the final report, the co-coordinators are Japan and uh, Antigua Bar Bar Bermuda. And what happened was when the silence was broken, th apparently there, was, there were negotiations between uh, especially the United States and South Africa, and the co-coordinators said that they were not willing, I think was the word, to entertain even more, more discussion on other issues. So it's gone strangely silent. Now, I know it's summertime, it's August, uh, people, people are gone. So obviously, September is coming up, and we're thinking that by the end of August, so it's only two weeks away, that they will have to come to some finalization. The other issue is that even in the same issue for non-communicable disease uh, agreement, it's almost finalized except for the same issue, the TRIPS. So um, this is obviously a big issue, even though TRIPS agreement has been in the previous declarations, the uh, antimicrobial resistance declaration, the, the ones for HIV. So the fact that they, it is, there's some efforts to pull, pull this out is uh, something that's, that's a, a big uh, concern. Um, I think I've answered all of, all of your, I can, I can get you the information about the, the, diff the, the differences about how, we, how TBS surpassed HIV, if you like. Carla Stay Global Research, and thank you for an absolutely marvelous presentation. Um, one of the things that has shocked the global health community is the fact that the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Malaria, and Tuberculosis has cut all funding to North Korea. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Dr. Jennifer Foran and uh, the Eugene Bell uh, Foundation have pointed out if you cut funding to tuberculosis, it's almost inevitable that resistant strains will develop. And it seems to me that this is almost a form of biological warfare. Uh, do you know what is the reason why they're cutting the funding? Um, it's suggested that they're under pressure, and the question is by whom? And what can be done? And how much of a uh, how much of a cut into the resources you have available is this going to amount to? But it, because it seems totally shocking. Yes, I just I just uh, heard about the issue of the North Korea, the the withdrawal of the Global Fund from North Korea. This has happened in the past with another country, Myanmar. I don't know if you're aware of this. So when that happened, I'm, I'm kind of answering your question in a in a round a little bit roundabout way, but. Uh, in terms of it, when that happened, other some other countries came together and put together a three diseases fund. I don't know if you if you remember that, but that that was the issue of Myanmar. So I don't know if there's something else is going to happen where other countries will come together and start to put uh, funds into into uh, North Korea. The resistance issue now. That's a complicated question because if you if you don't treat at all, right you're not going to develop, the, the organism is not going to develop resistance because they're not taking any drugs. Now, if they pick and choose the drugs, then you're going, you may have a problem, you may have a problem. 
where you uh, treat with substandard drugs, if you treat with, uh, in a, in a, you know, dose, doses. Is. So that's a problem. But if you don't treat them at all, I mean, I'm, and that's just, I'm not saying that you should do that, but then the resistance, you, you just don't have the opportunity to develop the resistance because you're not taking the medications that could, that could select for certain, uh, certain strains. So the pressure, where's the pressure coming from? Uh, I don't know. I can guess, but I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> speculate. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, I don't. Do you ha I don't, I'm going to turn to one of your colleagues. Colleagues here. Do, do you know anything about the the? You're the one who told me about this. <laughs> uh, about why who is putting the pressure? You don't want to say. Right. Let's uh, okay, move okay. on to the next <laughs> question, <laughs> okay. shall we? All right. Run. Rhonda Haubin and I'm a blog columnist at tots.de. Uh, my, I, I had heard recently at a di at, at a meal um, that that the UN had um, that UNESCO had its funding cut. Do you know anything to North Korea? Do you know anything about that? And then also the Eugene Bell Foundation is having a press conference because some of the things that they ship in aren't being allowed in. Etc. I think some of it was was places where they could put people who were, had TB children who they so they wouldn't um, they they there wouldn't be other people who would catch it from them or whatever they were building some kind of building materials. Um, is that something that that you people can you know treat as an important part of what you're doing because when there's sanctions that are doing so things like this, then it's totally contrary to so what so you're doing. If, if I may, am I understanding the question correctly? You're asking a question about UNESCO, the Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization. We're, we're talking about a health issue here. Right. So I'm a little confused as to why no, you're bringing up that question. Sorry, it's not, it's not the, um, yeah, the chil children. Yeah, there was so UNICEF. Funded. UNICEF, I'm UNICEF. sorry. Okay. UNICEF, yeah. So actually, I don't know. I don't know about the specific issues around the Uni UNICEF uh, uh, cuts, uh, cuts in funding. So I, I really, I don't. I feel like I can't answer that question, question for you. And uh, I'm not quite sure I understood the thing about the. I guess you're talking about isolation. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Again, I mean, isolation has been traditionally in the past been a way to, you know, you put people. That's when there were no drugs available, right? So, um, th but I don't know what they're specifically doing around that issue with the materials that you're talking about. Yeah. So, Carol and then Melissa. Hi, I'm Carol Landry with Agence France Presse. Just getting back to the political declaration, mm -hmm. um, can you explain what would be the impact of? Uh, the U.S. deleting some of the language for access to cheap drugs, as I understand it, what would be the impact in terms of uh, this whole campaign to what you said the political declaration should turn the tide on on fighting tuberculosis? Yeah, I think. I mean, this is this is this is a very serious issue now. With the way the pharmaceutical industry is. Cuts, cuts the world in a, in a way. For example, let me give you an example. Even though there's this protection on the, in the U.S., for example, let's use the example of bedaquiline, this, new this one of the two new drugs that we have. You know, the pricing in different countries is different. In the United States, you pay for bedaquiline, and my colleagues here say in New York that it's, you know, it's in the thousands of dollars. And I mean like fifteen to 30000 I think it's $15,000 of treatment. Now, South in South Africa, they've just gone to an all oral regimen, and Johnson Johnson um, has put to get has said, we are going to reduce the price to four hundred dollars a regimen. That's that's game changing right there. And then they made the further announcement, and you know, the Minister Mozzoletti said it for South Africa, and then the the representatives from the drug company said, oh, and by the way, we're going to reduce the price for every everyone. Four hundred dollars a regimen. So even though there's some, you know, movements to keep to protect the protect a certain certain markets, for example, let's say the United States, to protect certain markets, I think that uh, there are other parts of the world that can rally around and actually develop uh, develop systems in order to 
make sure the drugs get are available. If you think about it, a tuberculosis in the United States is not a big, there's not a, a lot of cases in comparison to the rest of the world. They're not in the top, you know, in the top 10 or the top 100 even. But um, I think that it, what it is is just an issue of the pharmaceutical industry trying to protect its, its interests. So, so I think that there are workarounds, unfortunately, that we have to do it like that. No, I think what happens is that it, it, we want to make, you know, uh, different countries have different, you know, the uh, drug industries, right? India, South Africa, th those kinds of places. And they want to have the ability to actually uh, sell their drugs on the market in a way that, that's affordable to, ev to uh, everyone. So I think having that language is important there as a, as a uh, standard. I'm just, I was, uh, I'm Melissa Kent, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I was just wondering if you, you touched on it a little bit. Um, the, you spoke about uh, the AIDS epidemic in the 80s fueling TB. And I'm just wondering if you could just sort of list some of the, um, uh, what, what has led to this, uh, this uptick in uh, tuberculosis cases. I think you talked about migration, obesity. Could you list a few of the issues that have led to, tuberculosis uh, re resurgence. And I'm also wondering if you've, you spoke about Ghana and South Africa having committed to attend the high level meeting. What are you hearing from countries like Canada, the UK and the US about taking part? Okay, so th what right now what, what we're doing, what the TB community is doing is really doing the push behind the scenes uh, and also making official letters to the heads of state, including your head of state. Now it's, I heard a rumor that uh, that your prime minister actually said, you know, I think he even, I think it was even Bill Gates, him, you know, like if Bill Gates came, then he would consider it. So I think he's he's uh, you know he's one of the ones that might that might actually show up. Hard to say. Um, it's just going to be hard to say if if the others. I know there's been uh, work we're working. There's a f list of 40 priority countries that we're looking at. Uh, France is is one of them. And Macron, there's been some efforts to actually get uh, uh, him him to also come. So there's, you know, where the TB world traditionally, unlike the HIV world, has not had a lot of activism. But now I think we've all woken up and say, let's let's do this. So uh, one important thing that's, uh, that I haven't mentioned is this global caucus of parliamentarians. Over 2,000 parliamentarians is led by Nick Herbert of the UK one of the members of parliament, and he has gone around the world and has mobilized members of parliament around the world. So we have, let's say, over 2,000 from many different countries uh, saying that, you know, then they can also put pressure on their on their heads of state to to come. So there's a grassroots involvement coming in, 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 in this area. Now, the issue, why tuberculosis is rising? Well, <laughs> um, you could, there, this, this link to people, for example, people with HIV, let's say, remember, one-fourth of the world's population is, is, is infected with tuberculosis. It's lying dormant in your bodies. Most people in the world, if your immune system is intact, 90% of us will not come down with the disease. However, if your immune system is lowered, for example, especially in the case of something like HIV, but diabetes is the same mechanism, your immune system is lowered, your chances of coming down with the active form of the disease goes up. So that's been one of the ways, that's one of the reasons why tuberculosis has gone up in some of these, some of these, uh, some of these countries. That's, uh, that's what's very important. Now, why the other, I think the socioeconomic reason is that, you know, for example, because of the lack of money, lack of interest, whatever, we have not see, what's, what's happened is that the TB control programs have been neglected. I'm a prime example of, the, of that experience here in New York. When I became the director, when I became involved with the New York City program in the 90s, the entire TB program had been decimated, decimated. So uh, see, I, I worked for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, I was set in with uh, Tom Frieden, who many of you uh, know, and we were basically charged with cleaning, cleaning this up. And that what that meant? Money was the first thing. And actually putting in the principles of TB, uh, TB control back. Uh, there's a very famous uh, study from Harlem Hospital just before 
the uh, uh, huge rise during the 80s, Karen Bredney put together a study. She looked at Harlem Hospital just, uh, just up the road here and found that 90% of the people that she looked at consecutive TB patients coming into the hospital, 90% of them came, went out and were lost. 80, actually, 89% were lost. Then a year later, some of them came back in, started treatment, and were lost again. So that showed how bad, and, and, the, TV, and the TB program in the city had no way to deal with it. So part of it is just neglect of basic TB control activities. I want to mention the specific issue of MDR, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Why do we have multi-drug resistant tuberculosis? Again, there's an example here from the city that's now gone, and it's now worldwide. Because you neglect the actual basics of tuberculosis, you make sure that people treat, take their treatment, you take it well, and you finish the treatment, then that creates the whole issue of people, oh, there's certain, I took certain drugs, I didn't take certain ones, and then you have the resistance again. So that, that is a big problem, and the reason, part of the reason is because we haven't done a good job of, uh, of uh, the TB programs in and of themselves. And third, poor cousin. The TB program has always been a poor cousin to HIV. You know, it's, w the HIV people were very smart. When this became a problem, they linked HIV programs to the president's office in many countries. You look at organograms, and HIV is way up there. TB is way down here as a poor cousin. No access. So it, that, that's, a, that's another reason, the, politi the political commitment. through PEPFAR and, and, and Global Fund as well, whereas TB and the vast yeah. majority of our national run programs. Yeah, I think that's important to say. You know, that, that, that people say, oh, you know, the, the, it's that the countries are not keep putting their, their money in. No, 60, over two-thirds of the funding from, for TB comes from national sources. The biggest external funder is the Global Fund. But as, as Michael's just pointing out, a lot of the funding for HIV comes from external sources like PEPFAR. For example, the United the President's Emergency Plan for Relief for HIV. So we just haven't had that kind of uh, power to get that kind of money. Mr. Abadi. Thank you, Mr. President, for organizing this meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Doctor, for an informative presentation. My question is this. A high-level meeting is being organized on a health issue at headquarters at the UN instead of headquarters at WHO. And you lay a lot of hopes regarding this meeting and you wish higher participation. Do you recognize, is it because you recognize that health issue, tuberculosis, has political aspect? Tuberculosis is a social disease, and it has medical implications. So I think that we, in the, in the medical side of things, we can do what we can, but it's not enough. We have to address the poverty issue. We have to address all the other social issues. And Minister Mozzoletti, I'd like to bring him up because he's just been such a champion for TB. I have heard him say on three separate occasions, if I am sent, if I, Dr. Mozzoletti, is sent to the high-level meeting at the UN, it is a failure because this is not a meeting of the ministers of health. This is, a minister, uh, this is a meeting of the heads of state. The heads of state have the power to do the changes that a minister of health you know, has his or her remit, but this is not about justice or whatever. Even, New again, I'll bring myself to <laughs> talk about New York again. When the New York situation happened, we had, a, we had a big consortium. We had the people from the housing department. We had the people from the police department. We had the people from, from all these different areas of the New York City uh, bureaucracy to help us deal with the issue of tuberculosis because it wasn't just a matter of giving medications. It was really addressing some of the housing issues that they had, mental health issues that they had, all those kinds of things. So it's very important. And so raising up to this, this high level uh, is, is really key. Be clear, it's absolute coincidence that I'm sitting here moderating this. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I have not been no. in conversation <laughs> with Dr. Mozzoletti, <laughs> but he's a good guy. Um, should yeah. we go for a second round? Anyone else for the first time? No? Okay, second round. Let's go with Edie. So it should be pretty concerning that I don't think you mentioned leaders of any of the five top countries with TB coming. Um, what about the 
biggest, what about the big donors? I mean, what, shouldn't you be doing more of a public um, campaign in those countries to try and get their leaders? I mean, it's all well and good doing something here, but I mean, in those countries, in, in those five countries and also in the major potential donor countries. You, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think we need to have, uh, for example, I, let's talk about the BRICS, okay? Uh, actually, India, India is in there. So, you know, Brazil, Russia, Russian Federation, India. Uh, I think that when, the, one of the reasons why I think the president of South Africa came is that the BRICS heads of state met, I think, two weeks ago, yeah. two weeks ago in South Africa, and uh, Minister Mozzoletti was there, and, <laughs> and actually, uh, I think he was uh, instrumental in kind of trying to, co in convincing the president to show his commitment and come. So part of this, you know, part of this high-level issue going on, so the, it, having the fellow heads of state talk to each other. President Putin from Russian Federation, he hosted the uh, ministerial meeting in November of the Ministers of Health. So he, the Russian Federation showed a great commitment to the issue of tuberculosis. And um, so e even though I, you know, I mentioned the five, top five countries, you said, oh, they're, they're not coming, but there are other countries that have a, lot of, they have a lot of burden of tuberculosis. Now, the issue that you mentioned about how do we get the, how do we get the push, I think that civil society has been increasingly important and we're wor they're working within their constituencies. They know the, the situation better than, you know, something like me coming in. Uh, that, so they, they have been working with their, uh, with their constituencies in order to actually push from the bottom. And I've seen something from Australia uh, last week where they're, they're again, pushing the, the head of state to come to the meeting. So that's going on in different countries around in India. That's going on in India right now. That, uh, that is going... Uh, South Africa. I mean, we've had we've had our. The, I mentioned France. I mentioned you know. There's other places where it actually is going on, and I think the parliamentarians can also uh, have also been uh, help for, for that. For example, uh, in May, the parliamentarians came together at the UN, and they decided that child TB was an issue that they were really particularly in, in interested in. So they're there pushing pushing the agenda there. So it's going on. It's going on. It maybe seem it, it does seem maybe quiet. But it is, it is the push is going on. It's it's oh, it's organized. Hi, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing with China? Because it is one of the top five, and I think you told me yesterday they were sort of silent. Yeah, China is part, but not part of the group of seventy-seven. Mm -hmm. And I have noticed this myself: is that uh, that they have been strangely quiet in this whole issue, even though they're, you know, they're uh, one of the high burden countries. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, all right. So um, anyway, so I don't, I don't know why China has not been very vocal. As you, as you probably, if you've probably been part of political declarations before, the wording comes out and then the missions all start to negotiate, right? So you can see where countries say, I want this, I don't want that, I disagree. To, I'm, it's not seen. It's it hasn't seen. So are you China are you doing forward. anything proactively? Because it is one of the five, and I don't know. Could you pressure regionally or work with those top five? Yeah, Asians? I personally am not involved in in that yeah. in that region. But so, um, yeah. but I think there are there are efforts going uh, efforts going on. Okay, and yeah. sorry, I had two more, if I uh -huh. may. Could you give us what what the latest is in Myanmar? You had mentioned it, I believe, in your opening remarks. And can you also, I, I, if I remember correctly, you said there were 40% missing mm -hmm. in TB. How much does migration and immigration issues play into that? I'm curious. It's hard that. to, it's, let me answer the second question. It's hard to know how much immigration or plays, because you don't know <laughs> they're missing. <laughs> they're missing, so we don't, we don't know that. The issue of Myanmar, um, your, the exact question around, is it around TB or? Uh, okay, so. There is a, they have a big TB problem there. It's, it's, it is related to HIV. My, or, my particular organization is one of the first that went in there during the whole dictatorship and uh, started, started interventions there. 
uh, I think what's important in Myanmar is working with and through government. So we say uh, that we work we work with the government on on that on on the issue. So TB is a big issue is a big issue there, and we are intimately we are intimately involved and linked to the HIV. We started with linking the two together, but then we not delink the programs, but now we used to take care of only people with TB and HIV specifically. Now we're dealing with, as I say, 31,000 people just with HIV alone. Doesn't matter if they have TB or not. And we're also dealing, we also deal with the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis issue. We provide support on that. Okay, uh, we have about five more minutes, so Carla. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, <laughs> The Gates Foundation uh, had contributed seed money to the Global Fund for AIDS Malaria, to fight AIDS Malaria and Tuberculosis. Has Bill Gates come out uh, and said anything about the cutting of funding to North Korea? And is he supportive of this? And secondly, um, the president of the World Bank, Jim Kim, Dr. Jim Kim, uh, had enormous success in treating multi-drug resistant tuberculosis in poverty areas and poorest areas in Peru. Um, and has he said anything about this? And is it there any possibility the World Bank could make up the uh, shortfall since, as you mentioned, the Global Fund is the largest contributor? Yeah, I don't... I, I I don't know if Bill Gates has said anything specific about North Korea. I don't think so. I, 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 yeah, since his announcement that he's coming, I haven't heard much, you know, much more press about about that. Dr. Jim Kim, uh, as you say, he's worked in Peru in the past, uh, dealing with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And the World Bank, uh, as you know, is basically loans. So they would loan the money. They're not going to give grants grants to the to these countries. So that would be, I think, uh, difficult. So just as a final question to you, um, TB's been around a long, long time, right? Yeah, yeah. Since the late 1800s, 19th century? Oh, since the mummies in Egypt. Okay, <laughs> well, I wasn't around there. <laughs> so why, why do we not have a vaccine? I mean, I, you know, when, you, when you talk to UNAIDS, they say we're about 10 years away from a vaccine for HIV, and this is a fairly new disease. Uh, TB's been around a long time. Why do we not have a vaccine yet? That's a very good question. I think that you can answer it on a couple of levels. One is the biological level. The, the, the TB, the mycobacterium tuberculosis, is a sneaky organism. And as I said, I mentioned that you know, there's a latency phase. So trying to address the issue, there are two issues. One, should you make a vaccine to prevent people from getting infected from the first place? Or should you make a vaccine that once a person is infected from, from them from progressing on to disease? So, Believe me, people have been working on this for years. There's a whole group of uh, TB vaccinologists that are working on it. But trying to actually get to the <laughs> get into that organism when it's dormant is a very difficult thing. Now, that's the biological piece. Now, why don't we have a vaccine, the financial piece? Because we don't have the money to do it, right? And I, and I think money is an important is an important issue. Why? Because again, get, harking back to my time in New York, New York City. There was no money for research. Then NIH, the National Institutes of Health in the United States says, ooh, we have to do something about TB. They started putting all this money. Then people started coming out of the woodwork. So if you have the money, the people will come. I've heard, I've heard scientists say, I had to give up my work on this or that because there was no funding on it. So that, that's part of it. So part of it is the biology of the, of the organism itself. The second thing is that the, 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 funding, the funding just for the research. Did you want to say something? More? I was just going to say we actually do have a vaccine, but it's one that's oh, yeah. not very effective. Yeah. I think we should oh, yeah. go we back. We have a vaccine. 50%, right? Yeah, 50. BCG. Okay, some of you in this room probably have had BCG as a child. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And okay, so what? <laughs> so, what it, where it works is for children under five to prevent like TB meningitis, TB of the brain, or the disseminated forms of TB. We do know it works for that. Do, but do we? Do we accept that a vaccine that's only 50% effective is a good thing? No, right? And it was, in de it was developed in 1922 or something like that by those, by those two, you know. So here we are 100 years later almost, and we still don't have it. So, yeah. Okay. So it does exist, but it's not good. Well, I don't know if I've had PCG, but I'll tell you what we're going to do now is END. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Fujiwara, thank you so much. And to Michael Kessler, thanks as well for facilitating this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us.